Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming here today from all over the world. Welcome to the second day of Zero Carbon Conference for students. I'm Tomoko Fujiwara from Japan. I'm working at Environmental Policy Div Division, Nagano Prefectural Government Office. I will be, I will be the MC today, and we today we focus on circular economy. And we have three great guest speakers and five uh, students present student presenters. After the presentations, we have time to answer que your questions and comments and discuss further. During the presentation, uh, all students can post your questions and comments through Padlet, which is an online board that we can use simultaneously from, all, uh, from around the world. We will be receiving this, uh, you will be receiving this link in the Zoom chat box and in an old YouTube channel. And we will be, uh, we will have different Padlet project for each day and the links will be announced at the beginning of each day and also during the session. Um, let me show you how to, how we are going to use Padlet. Uh, like this, this is the public for today. And we have um, each presenter section here like this. And before you write down your comments and questions, I would like you to log in from here, upper right here. And click log in. So you can log in with Google account, Microsoft account or Apple account. Let me try this one. And once you, you log in, you can see your icon here, upper light here, and you cannot see the login anymore. Then now you can uh, post any comments from here like this, like this, then uh, when press enter, um, the comments will be shown on this screen. And yeah, uh, once yeah, it will be shown and yeah, you can edit and delete your comments, but you cannot um, edit and comment of other, other people's comments. And I like you to, uh, I like to remind you basic ways of how to interact on the internet, be polite and be constructive and don't be insulting. We can use this also after the session and it's open for through the day. So speakers will come back at some point and uh, reply directly in the public. So uh, let's go, let's get started our, present, our presentation. So our first guest speaker is Mr. Lasse Okonen from Finland. Hi, Lasse. Hello, good hello morning. everyone. Good morning. <laughs> and good uh, Lasse, afternoon to those. <laughs> yes. Yeah, good afternoon. Lasse is principal lecturer in energy and environmental technology at Kaleria University of Applied Science. Uh, thank you for coming to joining to joining this conference and we are looking forward to hear your talk. The floor Thank is you. yours. Thank you. Just a second, I will share my screen. Yes, so <clears throat> this uh, speech I'm, I'm giving you this, this morning uh, is a kind of a conceptual conceptual presentation on the circular economy and also eco design strategies. And there, the first, firstly, I will um, 
present you uh, some of the concepts of the circular economy. Uh, that is the paradigm to change from the linear and, and highly, highly consuming economy towards more sustainable and economic model where materials are used in more efficient manner and energy is used in, in different quality levels. It, circular economy is a model for production and consumption. It includes many activities like sharing, leasing, reusing, repairing, refurbishing and recycling of the existing materials and products as long as possible to create new products to add value to, to materials and, and extend the life cycle of the products. So idea is to reduce the waste to, to its minimum. Of course, we always have some waste. We cannot avoid it totally. But we try to keep materials in the economy wherever possible productively, use them again and again, and create further value. And this would reduce the need of the raw materials, need of the energy, but also reduce the harmful waste and emission outputs. In Finland, we live in a forested country, with plenty of forests, and forestry is an important part of, of our economy. Forest it provides us a material, raw materials. It provides us many ecosystem services that support our living, bring us benefits, and, and uh, basically ma maintain our living in, in, in this country. So circular economy in, um, in this kind of forest-based uh, country, it, uh, it is, uh, of course, it covers many, many sectors, but in this uh, graph, that uh, it presents the forest-based loops. So we have primary sector that gives us raw materials and ecosystem services. Forests are, are also carbon sinks and they provide us well-being services. Then we can process the materials. Of course, the materials need to be produced in a sustainable manner and to ensure that the forests renew and they are productive, and also the materials that we utilize are high quality. In manufacturing industry, we can utilize energy and material efficient side streams, and we can add value to the materials. And in the Finnish bioeconomy strategy, it is essential that we add value to, to our materials so that we are not over consuming forest materials, but we are generating more value of, of less, less, less material. And then there are distribution actions where there are lots of logistics and transportations and there you can utilize digital services and digital applications to make these logistics more efficient and also reduce their environmental impacts. In retail sector, we can use, for instance, smart packagings and materials and companies can also collaborate together with different kind of uh, service and business models where they collaborate efficiently with, with each other. But what is really important is the consumer part because what we demand, what we want to have and buy, that of course affects to the production. And then therefore, uh, it's imp important that consumers express their needs and participate in the in the in the uh, production pro this in the product design. So designing of the products is essential, and you can reduce the uh, harmful impacts along this whole value chain. And you can also find ways to close loops, recycle materials, and use energy in more efficient manner and collaborate al along the value chain. So it, it, uh, circular economy is about also about design. And Ellen Mac MacArthur Foundation has defined some of the questions for the design. 
how might we design in a way that addresses user needs and, and, and uh, basically uh, that, that, uh, that those that work in, in long term, how we might create products and services that fit into our ecosystems and that become food rather than waste and pollution. Food means, of course, food products, but also materials that can be reused in other purposes. And how might we use design as a force for positive change? So by design, you can also address big challenges of this century, such as climate change and loss in biodiversity. We can affect to those challenges by using design as a tool. So in eco-design, we have find ways to develop more sustainable products and services. Actually, it is estimated that about 80% of the environmental pollution and up to 90% of the manufacturing costs are a result of, of the decisions made, taken at the product design stage. So there you can affect on the environmental profile of the product, you can affect on its social impacts, and you can of course affect on the costs. So life cycle approach is really useful for that purpose. By identifying the impacts from the raw material to the products, manu manufacturing and production and consumption and reuse, you can identify also the environmental impacts. Sometimes it is just small part of the product, small part, or small component or material that causes most of the harmful impacts, or the impacts are generated in one part of the production chain. And with life cycle approach, you can identify those hotspots, places where you can really affect on the design and where you can solve those problems. So life cycle approach, it supports designing uh, to reduce harmful environmental and social impacts. And you can also increase the positive impacts. So it is kind of problem solving and uh, creating uh, solutions to improve the products. And with life cycle approach, you can produce, for instance, environmental labels, and you can communicate those impacts that products have to consumers, so that those good environmentally better products, they get the positive label, environmental label, and consumer knows that, okay, this is potentially better than the others at the market, and can can then choose the better alternative. There are tools to uh, design products and services. Here is one that is very uh, traditional. It looks a bit complex, but when you, when you look it in more detail, it's not that complicated. There are many points that can be looked and you can compare products. In the light gray, there is a earlier existing product. And then in the darker gray, there is a new product. And you can compare the products and see that can you find cleaner materials, renewable materials, or recycled materials, or make the product recyclable. And further on, you can design distributions production technologies on reduce the impacts during the product's use and at the end find ways to manage the waste and maybe reuse or recycle the product. Or define totally new type of product, why not? So there are tools that help you in designing the product to become better. And as you see, it's not uh, of course, it is possible that when you do some improvement, you might cause a little bit harm to other aspects. So you need to look at it in a comprehensive manner. I marked yellow 
the optimization of the lifetime and strong product user relation. It is one of the one of the um, points that can be looked that the product is important for the user. It is something that user wants to keep, maintain, take care of, and it doesn't become waste. So my product for the uh, optimizing the lifetime and having the strong product user relation is a mug or a cup. My favorite cup from the year 1983. It is a gift from my aunt. It is important for me and it is really nice to use. It has lasted long. It is uh, really uh, my favorite one. So I have strong product user relation with this cup. That, that cup has a long lifetime. It, it is well made, it, it lasts, and it likely causes less environmental burden than many other products, or if I had to buy again and again new cups. But I'm quite happy with that cup, so that is my, uh, my uh, product with I have a strong user relation. So, Eco Design is a, is a tool to develop sustainability and the circular economy. And for that purpose, we have available softwares and methods that we can, we can apply. And I hope that you might get interested about designing more sustainable products, processes, and in that way, solve these challenges like, uh, like the rising global temperature, or increasing amount of waste or loss of biodiversity. So, thank you. Thank you so much for your meaningful talk, Lasse. I love your favorite cup. <laughs> and it's a very you. great example. And yeah, it covered from the basic, uh, what is circular economy and to how to implement that kind of uh, concept in Finland by using resources like forest and forest, firstly forest. And the eco design um, strategy is very inspiring. Um, although economy sounds too big to deal with, uh, but designing the product with strong user relation, it feels like we can, we, we are able to think about it and we, students also can do something. So yeah, thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. Yes, we can all do something. So we don't need to solve the whole economy, but we can do yeah. small things together and that creates the big, bigger impact. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. So next speaker is Miss Sophie Kato from Hakuba Village, Nagano Prefecture in Japan. Hakuba was one of the venue of the 1998 Winter Olympics and Paralympic Games. Sophie is cafe owner and the youngest uh, Hakuba Village counselor. Hi, Sophia. Sophie. Hi, Sophie. Hello. Hi, hello. Thank you for Good joining evening. today. Thank you. So, floor is yours. Okay. All right. So, hi, this is Sophie. Um, thank you for having me in this amazing conference and I'm excited to share with everybody about what we do in Hakuba and my cafe Seoul. So today I'm going to talk about what we do in Hakuba and what I do individually in my organic cafe for a small scale circular economy. Um, I don't have much time so let's start it. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about Hakuba Village. Um, how many listeners here who knows Hakuba? 
Um, as Tomoko mentioned, Hakuba was the main event venue for the 1998 Nagano Winter Olympics. As you might know, uh, famous for winter sports and ski resort. Uh, we can't define Hakuba without talking snow or winter. Although uh, Hakuba has only 50 years of history as a village, economic system is depending on winter tourism. However, the snow falls is getting less and less recently. Luckily, there are lots in this winter season, but it's been um, six years since I have been back to Hakuba and we haven't had much of it. I was shocked when I saw the ski result with few snow, very few snow. Here we are able to see visually that the global warming is happening in real. This graph is about the annual amount of snowfall and the average temperature in Hakuba. Um, as you can see, the snow is getting less and less and the average of temperature is going up. People in the city side of Japan, they can't imagine the climate changing dramatically as well as uh, we are feeling here. They might think that the summer is getting a little bit hotter, but there are air, condition, air conditioning everywhere. So I understand it is very hard to realize that we are in the moment of the global warming and climate crisis. But once again, here it's totally different feeling as we are closer to the nature. People have been coexisting with this nature by side by side. Um, in September of 2019, there was a global climate strike in Hakuba. We call climate march instead of a strike as we are not used to say strike in Japan, it's a, a little bit aggressive for Japanese people. Um, anyway, then some high school students and others presented the petition to the mayor Shimokawa. Then in December of same year, Hakuba village declared climate emergency. A village answered to the voice of students and other villagers. In, in fact, there is another reason that Japanese ski resort is in a serious situation caused not only by global warming, but also the population of ski resort users are in decline. That's why Hakuba has been promoting to foreign countries since then. And we have welcomed a lot of foreigners who want to enjoy Japanese snow. Currently we are facing COVID-19 and we are again struggling with economy because we are kept depending on winter tourism. So, the Tourism Commission of Hakuba started a new project called Green Work Hakuba. Uh, this is a project of learning and discussing about circular economy and also putting into practice so that we are able to clarify our future vision and make Hakuba sustainable mountain result. And now I'm going to talk about what I do as a small scale of circular economy through my organic cafe, Seoul. Uh, Seoul is located at the base of the Goryu Ski Resort in Hakuba Village. We are a vegetarian cafe, except using the locally produced milk for drink menu, 
we don't use any animal product for food nor sweets. Um, we provide vegan and slow food. Uh, I'm always trying to propose some hints for um, sustainable lifestyle to the customers. So here there are some tips to be responsible to protect the environment as an owner of small cafe. Um, I consider that purchasing food stuff for our cafe from our neighborhood is really important and, and I choose a supplier who cultivate or trying in a way of environmentally considerate. Uh, consuming locally is keep the things always simple and we are very close to producers so we can easily access to the information about how it has been made. The second tip is to compost by ourselves. And I also try to cultivate vegetable in my own farm. I think compost is the most simple way to practice, practice circular economy. The third tip is to be flexible with the content of the menu as it is impossible that to have um, same vegetable whole year. Today, we can always find same vegetable whole season in a supermarket, but it costs a massive energy to make that possible. We always have um, been wanted to nature follows us, but the truth is that we have to follow the natural cycle to be a sustainable society. The first tip is to provide vegan and vegetarian food. Um, we have to know also about the meat industry are also make a huge impact to the climate crisis. And the last tip is trying to reduce the disposable waste, which we use a lot for takeout food and drinks. So here is one example system, which we use in our cafe. Uh, this is an amazing deposit lunchbox system called Arupake. I tell you how to use them. So firstly, go to the member shop and register then pay the deposit and membership fee, get the membership card and take out the lunch with our packet. Later return to the any other member shop. Uh, there are uh, around 30 member shops around Nagano and you can use it everywhere of them with your member card. Easy to use and it makes um, possible zero waste takeout lunch. Uh, in conclusion, there are a lot that we can do as a small cafe. And I think it is not too difficult to input these little actions in your lifestyle. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, we could understand the current situation in Hakuba. And it's interesting that tourism organization is leading the uh, picture, the vision of the circular economy in Hakuba village. And also you showed us there are so many thing, things we can do as a, a one of citizens and like support local farmers and composting cabbages and using large box. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was, you know, it's great action, great, great example for all of them, all of you, all of them. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. So next, next speaker is Miss Tula Yusuke from Finland.
Hi, Tula. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Hi. She's a researcher, research manager in the Biocircular Research Program at the Natural Resources Institute of Finland, which is called LUKE. Um, yes. So I'm looking forward to hear your uh, talk and your research. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for your kind words. Um, I'm sharing now. So I'm really happy to be uh, participating in this conference. And um, today I'm talking about functional material solutions and how we are studying those at LUKE. And especially I'm focusing on um, forest-based material solutions and how those could be um, a key in transition towards sustainable future. So LUKE, the Natural Resources Institute Finland, we are a research organization and we are functioning under the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry in Finland. And our vision is a sustainable future and well-being from renewable natural resources. And through research, we create value and solutions for our customers, which can be companies or the whole society and we are solving these local and global challenges by research. Um, we are located all over the country, Finland, in 22 locations, and we have almost 1,300 employees, researchers, and other specialists. Our research is divided into different research programs which are shown here. So there is this profitable and responsible primary production, which means agriculture, forestry, aquaculture, and also um, game studies. Then the circular bioeconomy is studying the different um, possibilities to uh, smartly utilize our bio-based resources to add value. And this is where I'm working at. Then we have a research program related to the climate smart carbon cycle. And also we focus on adaptive and resiliency, a resilient bioeconomy. And now the examples I'm going to give are more related to the circular bioeconomy research program. So we know that there are changes in the operating environment globally. There are many, many expectations and demands towards natural resources, also forest resources. And many of the demands are a little bit like uh, contradictory. So we cannot fully meet all of them, but um, via science-based knowledge and data, we can make holistically sustainable decisions so that we can um, keep, keep up our carbon sinks in the forests. We can sustain the biodiversity and we can also produce materials that can be used to replace more harmful um, uh, products nowadays used for example fossil based materials and then we need to also keep in mind the other ecosystem services um, there are many drivers in our operating environment and we are, all, we are studying all of these aspects at LUKE to really make a um, holistic uh, basis for the holistic uh, decisions. So one of the most important issues in relation to forest-based biomasses and their uses in sustainable ways is to use the materials harvested as fully as possible. So we need new upgraded products which utilize all the wood-based components. And by this way, we can increase the resource efficiency and add value to the forest sector. Here you can see how 
nowadays we are utilizing our biomaterials from forests. So mainly um, the materials is used for, of course, for construction, but also for cellulose production. Uh, then some of the extractives can be utilized, but um, lignin and hemicellulosis are still mainly used for energy production. And we see that there is a lot of possibilities also to use these in a more uh, comprehensive uh, way to add value. And here is the vision for 2035, so that we could really make use of these materials. Hemicellulosis, for example, could be used in different hydrocolloids, <clears throat> in food, eat, pharmaceutical products, in different dispersion agents for chemicals. Lignin instead could be used in coatings, glues, different platform chemicals. Extractives, there are many different ways to utilize those. For example, bioactive components. And um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples later of this, which we are studying. Then the cellulose, of course, can be also used not only for pulp and paper, but also for the textiles. And in Finland, we are actually now, um, there are many companies who are developing this textile processing. Um, this is an example figure from the sawmilling side streams. So when we are harvesting timber and use it for sawn goods, from the volume, all harvested volume, only less than half is used for these sawn goods. And the second half is this kind of side streams which we could utilize better, like chips or sawdust, bark. So our research is trying to add value for these side streams. Um, and we create more from less. And we also take care of this um, principles circular by design. Uh, in Lasse's presentation, there were nice examples of the design. So this is also something we are keeping in mind while doing the research. And of course, the environmental benefits, so the carbon um, capture carbon in the products and so on. Here is another example of the comprehensive utilization of biomasses. This is an example where we utilized bark of a, a softwood species, Nova spruce, which is one of the most important commercial species in Finland. So first, the bark was extracted, and we could get out the polyphenol-rich fraction that can be used for different platform chemicals, for example, or different kind of uh, other high added value products. But then the residue from this process was directed to slow pyrolysis, and we could get out biochar, gas, and tar fraction. And then from this process, there was also this kind of side stream, which is pyrolysis condensate, a liquid, and that was directed to anaerobic digestion process. Also, the bark residues from the hot water extraction were directed here, and we could create biogas and digestates. So by this way, by combining these kind of different unit processes, we could comprehensively utilize the bark side stream and we didn't create any new waste streams. And we are studying this further, and we, are, we can also utilize different other raw materials and side streams. And this is very, very interesting to also scale up for the industrial level. Now I'm going to give you a couple of examples of the ongoing projects where we utilize the um, uh, polyphenol rich um, extracts. So the first example project is um, called development of bio-based materials for driving towards sustainable face mask production and reduced environmental impact, Bioplot. So in this project, we are developing uh, bio-based solutions for face masks and other personal protection solutions to reduce the plastic waste, which is now 
a quite big problem globally, of course. Uh, also, face masks are entering into the nature and they are usually made from uh, fossil materials. Additionally, we are creating this kind of uh, novel antiviral coatings for the face mask materials in this project, together with the University of Jyväskylä in Finland. Another example project is um, running parallel to the Bioprot project. And in this project, we are studying what are the antiviral mechanisms and structure activity relations of those antiviral and antimicrobial extracts and preparations we have already found from the Finnish forests and forest side streams. And in this project, um, we are doing a lot of international collaboration to, to um, for example, United States, Italy, um, France, South Africa. And here is one example publication from this project. We have found from salix, from the willow species grown in Finland, that there are very, very interesting novel compounds which have high antiviral and antibacterial antioxidant efficacies. And now we are studying how those extracts and some other extracts we have found could be uh, mobilized, immobilized to the surfaces of different materials, including face masks, but also other materials like coatings or packaging materials to create um, more hygienic solutions, for example, for food products. Okay, then I'm going to give you a couple of examples of the other kind of uh, functional materials we are studying at Luke. So we are trying to find solutions by different, by combining different materials from different sectors, um, because we see that this kind of cross-sectoral production chains are really the future. There is great opportunity for the new, new business. Of course, it's challenging, but um, by combining the materials, for example, from the um, forest industry side streams and fish industry side streams, we can create different films or packaging materials to replace plastic. Um, we can also create different kind of thermal insulating materials by combining feathers from poultry production, chicken feathers, um, in combination with um, wood fibers. Or we can create different kind of smart packaging by using uh, forestry side streams and also uh, food production side streams. Uh, we can give those side streams to the fungi. And when the fungal mycelia is growing, we can create this kind of very interesting composites for packaging, but also maybe some other purposes. Or we can create um, bioconcrete and different uh, thermal uh, composites by utilizing different um, fibers from plant materials or forest side streams. So we see there is a huge potential in this kind of biohybrid materials. And we can also study the nature and learn, learn from the nature, use this natural um, components, but also the way nature is building the different products as a biomimicry um, approach to create new products. So we at Luke think that when we have knowledge and research across the whole value chains, we can make impact and we can create circular economy. So we need to know how to utilize the biomasses in an efficient way, in a sustainable way. We need to understand what are the properties. We need to understand how to sustainably source and harvest um, and also store them to keep the quality high for the added value uses. We need to understand what is the best way 
to comprehensively use them, not only in laboratory level, but also in scaled up processes with industrial partners. And of course, we need to understand what is the functionality and performance of the products at the final stages, the prototypes. And here is also very important that we have the designing, like Lasse Okkonen was pointing out. We need to understand what the customers are needing and what, is they, what do they accept. And uh, throughout all this, we are also carrying out the life cycle assessment so that we can really understand where there is the potential for increased uh, sustainability. And to enter markets with these new biohybrid products, for example, we also need to understand the regulation and, and um, what, is, what are the steps for commercialization. Um, we are really happy to always collaborate with different academia partners, industrial partners. We do also customer services directly for the customers. And we can offer students um, possibilities to do their thesis. So please be uh, active and contact us. We will be happy to have you to work with us. We have good infrastructure, so the students could um, have an opportunity to, to work in a real life environment with us. We also offer different traineeships, so be in contact if you are interested. Um, and at the end, I would like to show you one animated video of our antiviral um, projects. So I'm going to share the video now. And please let me know if you can't hear the voice or see the screen. Is it visible for you? We can see your Good video. You. Yes. Bio-based antiviral solutions from Finnish forests. Are your hands suffering from the excessive use of disinfectants? Are you worried about the plastic waste generated by the use of face masks? New sustainable solutions are needed to prevent infections and replace fossil-based materials. The forest-based circular bioeconomy holds enormous potential for the smart use of natural resources. Forestry side streams open up new cross-sectoral business opportunities. One person's waste is another person's treasure. The Natural Resources Institute Finland and the University of Uvascula are cooperating in pioneering research. From the Finnish forests, we have discovered biologically active products that are greatly effective against viruses and bacteria. The impact of these products is extensive. Unlike alcohol-based disinfectants, they kill a broader range of viruses. These inventions can be utilized in face masks, cosmetics, cleaners, and coatings. By combining our expertise in natural compound chemistry, viruses, the sustainable use of biomasses and commercialization, we create new business. Creating an intelligent circular economy is a great opportunity for Finnish industry to further our path toward a low carbon society. Thank you. Thank you so much for your meaningful talk. And that was a great video to understand for students. And that's very interesting that um, the that antibiotic can be extracted from uh, forest biomes since we are all suffering from COVID-19 from all over the world. And also there are very important keywords I found like co-section and co-creation and co-innovation. And I hope that this conference will be one of the opportunity to uh, make bio-based circular economy possible by closing the section, generation, and countries. So thank you so much for your, your talk, Tula. Thank you very much.
Thank you. So let's move on to student presentations. First presenter is Mariano Stefano Josue Miniano Amesta from Peru. And he is studying at Jose Bacchiano Icarillo. So he will give a presentation about homemade compost bin. So you can start when you're ready. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. My project title is my homemade compost bin. And next slide, please. We have here the climate change backgrounds. The climate change refers to long-term changes in temperatures and human activities. Mm, greenhouse gases, methane gas destruction of the ecosystem. For instance, carbon dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and methane. It affects the fauna and flora survival of the earth, including human life. As a consequence, there are many changes in the ecosystem, like the desertification, floods, and level of the ocean. Next slide, please. Here we have four pictures about things that happen in my country. In the first picture, we can see people cut down the trees in my district. It happens in January in 2016. In the second picture, we can see many leaves on the land. It happens in 2017. In this third picture, we can see trash in many districts of Lima. It represents almost 80% of the districts of Lima. And in the last picture, we can see oil spill in the Pacific Ocean. And this happened in January 2022. Because of this, we talk about this problem in my school and in my family. So we elaborate this project based on the Brendan Casa strategy. Next slide, please. To make a homemade compost bean, we can say that it consists in put various organic remains in our reusable pots. We can use eggshells, fruit, and vegetables peels, dry leaf, land, vegetable stems, and coffee remains. It means that we can only recycle remains of vegetable origin. We cannot use bones of animal diet, animal feces, and use napkins, any kind of plastic, glass, metal, cigarettes, or mask. By making this homemade compost bin, I learned that. Um, next slide, please. And what it happens is a biology transformation of organic remains by the action of microorganisms. In the, in the presence of oxygen. During the process, we have to control the temperature, the humidity, and the air. We can obtain compost by four or six months. As we can see, this picture represents how the home compost bean works and how we obtain the compost. It means that all the organic remains goes to the homemade compost bin instead of going down to the land. Next. It is suggested to place it under the shade to avoid excessive drying on short days. And it is suggested to have an unhermetic lid that allows air to enter, but at the same time, prevents it from entering rainwater. As a result, we obtain compost that we can use in our plants at home, in our community, or in our school garden. So we can close the, the circle of the degradation of the matrix. 
Next slide, please. Making a homemade composer is a simple action that can help a lot to reduce the quantity of organic and inorganic waste that is placed at home or community space. I wish everybody could have a homemade compost bin so we can reduce the greenhouse gases to protect the earth. Thank you so much for hearing me. Thank you so much for your presentation, Mariano. That's great to hear that you actually try to make compost bin. And I guess it's not easy to control temperature and humidity and air. Yeah, and it's a great example which we can do at home and school and community. So thank you so much, Mariano. Thank you so much too. Thank you. So next presenter is Rei Hasegawa from Japan, from Nagano, Japan. Yeah. She's studying, hi. Hi. <laughs> She's studying at Matsumoto Agata Gaokasunia High School. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So let me start my presentation. Hello everyone, or good morning or good evening. I'm pretty happy to meeting you from many countries. I'm Dei Hasegawa from Nagano, Japan. Today, I want to have a presentation about food waste problem and my idea about it. My theme is find a new value of food, not just for eating. The subtitle is solve the food waste problem. Next slide, please. So before I start my presentation, let me share a little of my background. I have been living in Azumino City for 17 years. Look at this picture. There is such a beautiful scenery of great rice fields in Azumino. Now here Azumino is winter. Usually in morning time, the temperature is under zero degrees and it's near to Hakuba, which is the place the 1988 Nagano Olympic was held. And so let's back to the presentation. As the number of people who moved to Azumino increased, rice field has been changed into residential land. That disappointed me a lot. Then I became interested in agricultural products. My school has a class called Tankyu in Japanese. In the class, we can do research activity according to our own interests. I wanted to work on the topic of rice. So I am going to focus on the rice, which can't be sell, uh, sorry, which can't be sold at supermarkets because they are damaged too much. In my imagination, most foreign people Im imagine that Japan is abundant in rice related to sushi or rice ball. It's true, but at the same time, the amount of rice which has to be thrown away is large. One of the reasons is that our eating habit has been westernized and Japanese people no longer eat rice at every meal. This may cause rice waste. Next, please. Then I think finding its new value will lead to less food waste. I want to make a new way to use wasted rice other than eating. Next, please. This is my idea and goal. Cutter pencils made from rice. We can use rice, which is no longer eaten, to make cutter pencils. This is exactly my way to solve the problem. I hope that by using these pencils, more people will be aware of the preciousness of food. But can you imagine? I will show you how I made it. Next, please. 
So when I searched ingredients of normal cutter pencils on the internet, I suddenly came up with the idea that these ingredients could be replaced with other things which are made from rice to make cutter pencils leaves. That was the beginning of my making activity. And these are four pictures of ingredients. From the left, we need rice wax, rice clay, rice glue, and cutter powder made from blueberries. First, mix rice clay, rice glue, and cutter powder well. Its texture is like a cookie dough. Then melt rice wax and put it into the dough and dry them well. A result, I was not able to make what I wanted to. I couldn't complete the task. So I have three reasons. The first one is related to rice wax. It was, sorry, it was difficult to control the temperature when I tried to melt it. So it didn't blind with the dough well. And uh, oh, sorry, next slide, please. Yes, I failed this experiment and a result, I was not able to make what I wanted to. And the reasons are related to rice wax. It was difficult to control the temperature when I tried to melt it. So it didn't blind with the dough well. And can you see yellow or light brown parts? These are rice wax, which didn't melt completely. And second, the surface was too dry and cutter didn't stick to the paper. This is the most serious problem about pencils. So I need more trials. Also, it was harder than ordinary cutter pencils. And as you see in this picture, I couldn't make it into a thin column-like shape, which a pencil's lead has. So next time, I would rather make it thicker like crayons. So this time I failed, but I think this idea is worth challenging. So I want to continue my try and I'm glad if it, if it becomes a useful way to solve the problem. I think all countries have some have same problem. And what does your country do to solve these problems? If you have any ideas, please give me your opinions or your advices. That's all for my presentation. Thank you for listening today. Thank you so much for your presentation, Lei. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, uh, great uh, point. You focus on food waste and try to figure out a new usage of the, uh, like making color pencils. And even though the, experiment was unsuccessful, it means that you are getting closer to success. And I'm sure all scientists, including Tula, um, face, uh, tried, have tried uh, many times and failed, but they don't give up. So I'm looking forward to seeing the further your, your trial. Thank you again, Elaine. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So next presenters are Ugune Yanikoskite and um, Aida Kostite from Lithuania. They are students in 11th grade at President Bardo Adamus Gymnasium, which is the only ecological school in the Baltic States. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Aida and Ugune. Hello. The floor is yours. Thank you. So, a circular economy model aims to close the gap between production and natural ecosystem cycles on which humans ultimately depend upon. This means eliminating waste, composting biodegradable waste, or reusing, remanufacturing, and finally recycling waste that is non-biodegradable. By using this model, we stop from being produced in the first place. 
It is a system that aims to tackle climate change, biodiversity loss, waste, and pollution. Circular economy model reaches for a more stable and sustainable future for our Earth and especially its nature. Next slide, please. Thank you. In Europe, the movement on sustainability, which is a big part of the circular economy, is becoming increasingly popular. One example of this is Europe's Directive on Single-Use Plastics. The, use direct, the directive bans certain single-use plastics for which alternatives are available, such as plastic straws, cutlery, some food containers, and even sticks that balloons are attached to. Next slide. Uh, we can proudly share that our country, Lithuania, has done a pretty good job at developing a decent recycling system where the community can participate. In fact, our community can do lots to participate in the making of a better future. One of the most major things in Lithuania's circular economy is how clothes are worn until they can't be anymore. It has become a habit and even a part of a Lithuanian's lifestyle to now throw away anything that can still be used. For example, people often keep old clothes that they don't or can't wear anymore for one reason or another, so as to not throw them away, but to pass down to their relatives, friends, sell them to secondhand stores, or bring them to charities which support people in need. Um, another good example of this is how in Lithuanian households, toys get passed around the family tree. If a child outgrows their toys, the family usually passes the toys down to the younger relatives, which eliminates the need for them to buy all new toys. So in general, most people in Lithuania like to give their things like clothes and toys a new life. Almost all residential buildings, houses, and flats included have some form of recycling as it is required. In cities, throughout public spaces, there are recycling bins too, so people can throw their trash away as they should, even when they're on the go. Another thing our country, like some other countries in Europe, has developed is a terror, terror deposit system. When drinks in cans, plastic, or glass bottles are purchased, a deposit of 10 euro cents needs to be paid, which is an incentive to turn the tear in to designated recycling spots so the money can be returned to the buyer. As of 2018, the deposit refund system has had a tear return rate of 93% in Lithuania. Along with what we already said, there are also places where you can turn in your trash that is not too common. There are boxes in some grocery stores where, where you can turn in your smaller electronics like batteries, bulbs, all phones. There are also designated organizations which take in large electronics, machinery, and furniture to accordingly and safely dispose of them. Next slide, please. Uh, since our school is ecological, our community considers the topic of nature, ecology, and sustainability very important. Because of this, we have many opportunities to participate in events, competitions, lectures, and projects just like this one. And not only this, we also get possibilities to realize our creativity through similar topics as our gymnasium organizes a project, Eco Ideas Lietuvai, or Eco Ideas for Lithuania in English, uh, for all classes in our school. During this project, each class has to present an idea and a prototype of a product that is supposed to be from recycled and natural materials only. For example, one year, our class made a chair from used plastic soda bottles. Um, this project was implemented into the school space and used by students. In addition to this, our school has a system which allows us to bring in any electronic or to be disposed of properly. Our students participate in this bringing all batteries or phones that do not work anymore, but also big electronics like fridges and TVs have been brought to their students. Um, next slide, please. Uh, sorry to interrupt your presentation. Your voice, uh, we couldn't hear your voice, so please make sure to to mic close to your mic, please. Uh, I cannot hear you. No. Okay, I don't know what to do. Mm. Mm. 
Could you try again? Mm. Can you hear us? Yeah, now you can, I can hear your voice. Okay. Should we like restart this um, slide? Uh, yes, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, so since our school is ecological, our community considers the topic of nature, ecology, and sustainability very important. Because of this, we have many opportunities to participate in events, competitions, and lectures, uh, and projects just like this one. Not only this, we also get possibilities to realize our creative creativity through similar topics as our gymnasium organizes a project, Eco Ideas Yetwe, or Eco Ideas for Lithuania in English, for all classes in our school. During this project, each class to have has to present an idea and the prototype of a product that is supposed to be from recycled and natural materials only. For example, one year our class made a chair from used plastic soda bottles. Um, this project was implemented into the school space and used by students. In addition to this, our school has a system which allows us to bring in any electronics that we do not use anymore to be disposed of properly. A lot of students participate in this not only by bringing all batteries, bulbs, phones that do not work anymore, but also big electronics like fridges and TVs have been, have been brought in by students. So oh, next slide, please. Uh, to sum up, we wanted to say that the communities we, we participate in as well as us are trying their best on the road towards sustainability and a better future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your presentation, Aida and Ugane. That's good, good to know that you have great uh, recycle system in Lithuania and young generations like you know well about that. And it was interesting that Lithuania's lifestyle, uh, most people like to give their things and toys and clothes to uh, a new life by uh, passing down to their relatives. And that's cool. <laughs> and also the school project was also great. And I guess it, it can be a great example for also any school on the world. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. So next presenter is Miki Kikuchi from Nagano, Japan. Please turn on your camera, please. Okay, so she is studying global businesses and entrepreneurship at the University of Nagano. Hi, Miki. Uh, Hi, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let's start. Yes. Okay. So hello, I'm Miki Kikuchi from the University of Nagano. I'm very excited because I never imagined I'd be giving a presentation in such a big conference. And I'm not an expert and used to be totally indifferent to environmental and social issues. To me, the issues were only stories in the newspaper. As an ordinary citizen, I always separated my garbage and recycling properly and thought of myself as doing something good. However, I didn't deeply understand the mechanism and the impact of the recycling system in Japan. Last year, I held two events. These activities had a big influence on my interest in environmental and social issues. In the remainder of this presentation, I'll be talking about the two events and showing what we can do as non-experts. So first, let me outline these two events. Please, next slide. I invited Shun Takenaka and Miho Murata to hold lecture meetings on environmental and social issues. Initially, I was interested mainly in their backgrounds or viewpoints rather than their lecture topics. Simply, I like the people. Please, next slide. So first, the events, the invited speaker, Mr. Takenaka, describe the present situation of an orphanage man humanities in Nepal. This event was an important chance to know what is in 
what is going on in Nepal. And I was able to get connected with people from Nagano City who are interested in environmental issues. And two months later, I was preparing for an in-person event in Nagano City. I had difficulty finding a venue and deciding the topic. But luckily, the people who I met at the first event gave me some good advice. During the second event, the invited speaker, Ms. Murata, presented an analysis of a lot of data on un unusual weather, recycling, and so on. And interestingly, her main idea was to have fun taking care of the earth. And we thought about how to put her idea into practice. And what I learned from her presentation was the importance of data literacy. She told us the Japanese, Japanese recycling rate, which was said to be 84%, was in fact only 23% if using criteria adapted by many other countries. In contrast, Japanese recycling rate includes things that are excluded uh, using other criteria, for example, burning recyclables domestically or exporting recyclables. In fact, 60% of the total 84% is burned or exported. At first, I was shocked and worried about what impact the actual Japanese recycling rate has on the environment. However, this experience gave me a chance to talk, talk about this topic with more people and get more information. Through this topic, uh, through this experience, sorry, I learned it is important not only get information itself, but also learn how to analyze it from various perspectives. In short, the combination of data and literacy is very important. Please, next slide. For example, let's think about the Japanese recycling rate of 84%. How you understand this figure will make a very big difference. Please click. If you think that in Japan, 84% of all materials are, bar are being burned or uh, be sorry, if you think that in Japan, 84% of all materials are being turned into other things such, such as resources, uh, you will recognize Japan as one of the most advanced country in recycling. Please click. In contrast, if you understand the reality of the Japanese recycling system, uh, you can think carefully about the meaning of 84%. Please click and your option for action will increase as you gain more information and understanding. I have not concluded whether Japanese recycling is good or bad, but simply I want to know about more. I want to know about it more. I'm aware that I still only have basic knowledge, so I need to continue to get more information, think about the issues, and reflect on my lifestyle. I'm in the cycle of recycling my views. Please, next slide. Data literacy is a key to the circular economy. The two events I introduced today have not physically increased the recycling, but instead have enhanced the literacy of the participants who have, in, who have changed their behavior to help improve the circular economy. You don't have to be an expert when you try to do something for the arts. These days, we can access a huge amount of information. However, it's easy to misunderstand the true meaning of data. We have to be careful not to, not to get information from just one source and quick, quickly believe it. Please, next slide. So let's talk together about the environmental and social issues. And please give me some hints about holding another event. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much for your great presentation, Miki. And I was impressed that you said oh, we can make a difference even if you are, we are not an expert. So that's I think that's true. And also, 
that's a great point. You focus on raising the data literacy by planning um, attractive events with experts. And yeah, knowing the real fact is the first step to find out solutions, I think. So thank you again. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. So the last presenter is Asumi Kato from Canada. She is a Japanese high school student at Matsumoto Kashi Senior High School in Nagano, and she is currently studying abroad. Hi, Asumi. Thank you Hi. for coming. Thank and you for having me today. I guess it's midnight. <laughs> yeah, you. but that's fine. <laughs> Okay, so floor, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And so I'll start my presentation now. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Asumi Kato, a Japanese high school student. Um, I was in high school in Japan, but I came to Canada as an exchange student last August. Um, today, I'd like to talk about my project related to realizing a circular economy. This is called Ethitheria. To encourage young people to make more sustainable choices, I'm running a website and Instagram account and writing articles about sustainable lifestyle tips. This project aims to increase the number of young people who take action for social problems. I got interested in environmental problems when I was 15 years old, and I've done many extracurricular activities since then. For example, I joined a youth non-governmental organization, wrote a policy recommendation to the Japanese Ministry of Environment and held a lecture event for high school students. However, I didn't feel like I was making a difference against the problems. Even if I did many projects, not so many people actually started to take action. Rather than doing some political or academic activities related to the problems, I just wanted to do something that can lead to many people's actions. When I held an online lecture event for high school students, I heard many voices of young people who were interested in environmental problems. It was impressive to me that many people told me that they were eager to do something against the problem, but they just didn't know where to start. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also, some research shows that there are actually few people taking action against social problems. One of the Japanese entrepreneurs carried out an in interesting experiment. He was standing with an eye mask on a street in a crowded city in Japan. He was standing, um, oh, sorry, uh, besides him, he put a board saying, if you're interested in social problems, please give me a high five. He had been standing there for an hour and 33 people gave him a high five. It means people came to him more than once every two minutes. After this, he replaced the board with another one saying, if you are taking action to solve social problems, please give me a high five. Just like the last time, he had been there for an hour and only four people came to him this time. As it shows, there is a certain gap between the number of people who are interested in those problems and the number of people taking actual action to solve them. In particular, Japan has much fewer young people who think they can make a difference for society and the country. In 2019, the Nippon Foundation carried out research on young people in Japan, China, Korea, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, the UK, Germany, and the US. In this research, it turned out that the proportion of Japanese 18 year olds who think they can change society by themselves was only 18.3%, the lowest among the nine countries. The second lowest percentage was Korea's, but still it's more than twice as much as Japan's. Next slide, please. Um, regarding this situation, I wanted to suggest to young people that it was not so difficult to make a difference for this society. 
Ethereum is run by Japanese Generation Zs, and it is an info source about sustainable lifestyle for Generation Zs. What I'm doing is writing articles related to sustainable products, stores, or brands. For this project, my definition of sustainable is something friendly to society, the environment, and animals. For example, I'm featuring cruelty-free cosmetics, zero-waste shops, vegan restaurants, and more. On my website, I'm posting a detailed explanation and introduction on each topic, and I'm posting rougher information on Instagram posts. Also, on Instagram stories, I'm reposting Instagram posts or reels of other people related to sustainability. In this way, people can notice that there are actually so many social friendly choices around them, and they can make a difference for this society, even if it's just a small one. Next slide, please. Now I'm about to try some other business and activities as well. I'm preparing to start a clothing rental service featuring ethically produced clothes. We haven't started the service yet because we are still dealing with some issues, but we are looking for testers to improve this service. If you currently live in Japan and are interested in being a tester, please contact us from the, from the application form in this QR code. Also, I started, a po I started a podcast with one of my peers who is running business together. In this podcast, we talk about many topics, though our main focus is sustainability. You can listen to it on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, and we are trying to update it, update it weekly. Though all episodes are still in Japanese, we might also make an English version soon. And that's all of my presentation. If you want to check my social media, website, podcast, please check them out via this QR code. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for your presentation, Asumi. Um, that's a great uh, that you are running a website and Instagram and podcast mm -hmm. and writing articles to encourage young people to, to make more uh, sustainable choices. And to all participants, if you missed the link and QR code, uh, we are going to post uh, to ah uh, yes post mm -hmm. to uh, on Padlet and Zoom chat and mm -hmm. you can visit. Thank you so and, much. <laughs> and I also came up the idea that you can collaborate with Miss Shina Miss Shina Tsuki, mm -hmm. uh, who gave a presentation yesterday. She's making cosmetics. So oh, yeah. Also yeah, that's amazing. If you yeah, if you contact with her. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And I'm excited to see uh, that you launched the new uh, rental service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, let's move on to the discussion part from here. So I'm honored to introduce moderator, Professor Masaaki Shimura from here. Thank you, Tomoko. Um, very good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone, wherever you are in the world. <laughs> Welcome to discussion segment of Zero Carbon Conference Day 2. I'm your moderator, Masa Shimura from the University of Nagano. Also joining us are all the presenters who gave us a fantastic talk on circular economy. Now, um, just a quick housekeeping first before we start. Uh, we decided to have extra half an hour session for you after uh, today's conference, where you can uh, ask general questions to our presenters uh, who are available. So please free, uh, feel free to join it after today's conference. Now, um, in this discussion segment, I wanna make sure we hear from all the presenters to answer your questions. And now we have comments and the questions are piling up as I speak. Um, so without further ado, um, let's get started with our first question um, to Lasse. Yeah, yeah uh, 
Please welcome all presenters now. Sure. So please turn on your camera, please. And yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think now we can see all all faces. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I'll continue now. Okay. Yes. And Go ahead. so um the first question then goes to Lasse from uh, Ian. And I have extra um, second screen with me now uh, where I can see questions coming from our audience. So now um, the first question to Lasse. Um, um, now um, Ian um, commented on the aspects of the uh, raising consumer awareness. And I will read these questions out loud. And then uh, I let you address to this question, um, Lasse. And Ian wrote, um, uh, part of the circular economy model, you lay out requires um, consumers voicing their needs and their interest in more ecologically sustainable products. Is there any? Is there a need for consumer awareness outreach outside of product design? If so, and how are some ways that can be achieved? So um, would you care sharing your thoughts, um, Lasse? Yes, thank you, Professor. Uh, yes, I think this question is a really, really essential, essential one. And, mm. uh, and uh, basically the life cycle management and eco design is about creating products to the customers who are actually the key stakeholders of the businesses. They are the number one stakeholders. Mm -hmm. They are the most important ones for the businesses to survive, to, 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 to pro become prosperous. And, and, and uh, therefore the consumer voice needs to be there. And businesses are utilizing uh, stakeholder uh, uh, kind of uh, consultations and and stakeholder voices like like consumer associations and also mm -hmm. NGOs non governmental organizations in uh, in uh, uh, in their development process mm -hmm. and uh, so so I think that it's essential that consumers are involved and so that they are involved not alone but together so that they can. They can uh, they can contribute so that they that they uh, that, that there are also associations and organizations who mm. represent consumers, so so that the uh, businesses can then gather kind of uh, overall op opinions, and mm. and, and there they are really really good good processes and tools for that. Like like I mentioned, the eco labeling that is basically to to inform consumers. Consumers mm -hmm. attend in developing those schemes and then they receive the information on, on what the product is about. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I think Ian, Ian uh, the actual point is that uh, the more we can involve consumers in different phases of the life cycle, the better these mm -hmm. life cycles of the products become. And there is still plenty of work to do in that mm -hmm. sector. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Lasse, informative uh, comments. And um, I'm just wondering, you, since you mentioned the government's uh, kind of involvement in um, raising consumer awareness in, in the circular economy, um, I, I just wonder, the, the, um, you refer the, um, you know, the conceptual strategy uh, of the Finnish roadmap to uh, circular economy in your presentation. And I'm just wondering about the, you know, the role of the Finnish government, uh, for example, in raising the customer you know, consumer awareness in, in the circular economy as a national kind of agenda. And I, I wonder how significant, um, you know, is the, the role of the government is? And do, do you think, do you have any thoughts on that? Sorry, I'm just a bit digressing, but- um, uh, that, uh, that, that is a uh, uh, challenging question. Yeah, yeah the, the strategy processes, they involve, of, of, of course, they, um, uh, stakeholders and also the also the consumer associations, mm. uh, but I would say that uh, in in Finland uh, there there are kind of um, there's a tradition of utilizing different kind of um, 
kind of uh, steering or, or guidance mechanisms, like mm. like giving some economic support or using the legislation or norm or having the information campaigns. But the government uh, does support information campaigns, but not in uh, I would say not in extensive manner. Uh, mm. so, so 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 they utilize many instruments, economic steer, steering mechanism supports, also taxation. It is really easy to <laughs> guide with taxes, and and, and then in information and let's say so many, many many instruments are there. But I think this uh, information sharing, mm. information campaigns that could be much bigger in, in much bigger role. Mm -hmm. and that, that's very interesting. I mean, I mean, I've seen the variety of the collaborative project between the government and non-government sectors um, during my time at the uh, United Nations in Geneva, and uh, I, I've seen this significant and you know, crucial role to play, you know, to raising the, um, you know, all these agendas. So uh, thank you very much. I um, um, appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so um, we have uh, another question, and um, let's, uh, next question goes to uh, Sophie. And uh, this question comes from Manik, and which is, um, can you tell us how you maximize the number of times a box used? A um, bit of a practical uh, questions, but um, uh, would you care to answer this question, please? Yeah, thank you for the question. And um, I don't see the meaning of maximize the box. So mm. is it is it the meaning is um how many times the box can be used? Probably I would say so. This question it's a comment. Um, um, uh, he, he Manik wants to know the you know how many times basically how many times box can be used for you know recycling yeah, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So the box is really um. It's not a disposable box, uh -huh. so um, we can use as much as we we want to, mm, basically. Mm, mm. And we we are uh, we have a lot of stock in our cafe and restaurant. Uh -huh. mm. um, in my cafe, we have um, around ten stocks. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So and um, the members can return the box. Um, anywhere you want to, if the, the shop is mem in the member. Mm. And so it's um, re literally um, recy um, cycling the box in the, in the area. Mm, 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 mm. Right, right. Okay, well, well thanks for that. Um, I hope Manik um, answered the qu your questions. Um, thank you, Sophie. Okay. Well, uh, we have another questions lined up, so I'll move on to the next one. Um, it's this question goes to Tula, and I will read the comments out loud first, um, which is the concept of utilizing the reactions from the production of the forest-based resources sounds intriguing. Are there any challenges to bringing this technology to a larger scale? So, um, Tula, any thoughts on the? challenges to expand to a larger scale in this case? Thank you for the uh, question, uh, Professor. Um, yes, there are challenges. Um, mm. If we, for example, consider the um, forest industries, um, there is this kind of a scaling up uh, challenge because many of the side streams which I showed in my presentation that could be used for added value. They are now being used for um, energy production mm. or producing heat, uh, electricity and so on. So they are kind of used and utilized. So they are important part of our bioenergy production. Um, mm. So this needs to be taken into account um, that many companies may, may have some um, some, um, how to say, like, um, they are not so willing to develop some added value uh, concepts if they don't see the direct benefits for them. Sure. And it requires yeah. a lot of um, research still, and especially research in scaling up in order to make it economically feasible. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I think these are the ma- major challenges mm-hmm. at right. the moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So many uh, aspects has to be in the into consideration of, of this um, aspect. Okay. Well, thank you very much um, for that. Thank you. Okay. Um, for um, next question, um, we are now going to our student presenters now. Um, the first one uh, goes to Mariano, and the which is um, how do you control the humidity and temperature? I think you were talking about the uh, um, composter right? the, um, in your presentation. So, uh, Mariano, would you care sharing your thoughts? Thank you so much for the question. We control the humidity uh, by looking if there is any water in the surface or if we press the land. If it occurs, we can add dry leaf, paper, or land. And we control the temperature by moving the compost bin and probably we can add a little water. The temperature should be between 30 and 50. Mm-hmm. Okay, right. Um, well, thanks very much. Uh, well, um, I'm not very familiar with the use of the compost, but um, myself, but um, I have learned it uh, from your um, talk uh, today. And thanks, Mariano. All right. Now, uh, moving on to the next question, which goes to uh, Ray. Um, I'll read the question out loud first, and which is, a, is it normal to produce, uh, for example, rice wax from rice? Or is this a step you had to do beforehand? Uh, another bit of a technical um, questions, but um, um, what is your thoughts, um, Lei? Yes. It's about rice wax, um, this question is about. Yes. Um... It means that I made a uh, rice wax, right? Right. I, did, I, I think did I make a rice wax? I think this question is about, um, you know, that wax could be used for, the, you know, candle, uh, things uh, yeah. like that. Right. Yeah. And I think he's asking, you know, if it's the possibility um, of, of that um, and asking, is it normal or, or not? And, but I, I, I would say that um, you can create many things from rice from what I understood. And so do you have anything to add? Yes. So usually the rice works made into candle that you said, mm-hmm. but this time I used rice works as sticker, like the uh-huh. roll mm-hmm. of sticker of mm-hmm. making crayons or making the mm-hmm. leaves of pencils. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's mm-hmm. the roll of stick the things together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right. Is it okay? <laughs> right. Okay. I think this. Uh, I think you you answer the question for this one. Uh, if I can add a little bit about uh, rice, um, uh, you know, I think this is pretty much uh, Japanese perspective on 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 that um, uh, sustainability. But I, I um. My mother comes from uh, actually um, uh, Nagano, and uh, you know, for for a few generations back, um, pretty much they live in a sustainable way, actually. And um, uh, rice is a good example. Uh, you know, I remember um, you know from rice you can create shoes, raincoat, and you know for for rice straw, you know, and, and mat, and so forth. And uh, this can be reused, repaired in that time, you know, back half century ago or, you know. So in a way, uh, rice always reminds me that in, in Japanese perspective, it's a very sustainable and mm-hmm. it's still people, you know, can find the old ways. And I'm pretty yes. sure that um, in any country, if you go back and ask your grandparents, they know how to use the things and how to repair the things. So I think, you know, uh, I'm just telling a Japanese perspective, but I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, from today's uh, student uh, presenters from Lithuania or Peru 
Uh, mm -hmm. If you go back, you know, ask your grandparents, they would tell you, probably, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so let's move on the, um, the question for next one. Um, now, um, it looks like we exhausted the questions, but um, I think I would like to um, um, just ask all of you, the, the panel members, um, the, um, you know, we, we know that it, it is important that, you know, the, the, for, you know, sustainability or all these um, um, circular economy, it doesn't just happen by itself. And we need work together. And, and for that, my question is, how do we, um, you know, involve, you know, the communities, you know, to actively participate in circular economy? I mean, today we have a, um, you know, presenters talking about the, you know, for example, Asumi. Um, you know, you have been pretty active in, in this. Uh, you have own uh, website, right? And, and which helps circular economy ideas and, and initiative in the public. And, and so I wonder, say for, this is your question, Asumi, do you have any, anything to add on, you know, how do we involve communities, uh, you know, participate in the circular economy? Um, like, first of all, um, maybe you have to think like you actually can make a difference for society. Mm. Like, I think many people are not like, so many people don't think that they can make any difference like for like this big society, but mm -hmm. it actually like you can make some small differences, of mm. course. Because like what you buy and what you choose for your daily thing, it mm. it will really it has really impact on like society and companies or anything. So like your choices are really important for this society, like for mm. the direction where the society goes. So um, I think uh, you think I think you have to have hope that you can actually change society and do something like it's okay to do something really small but if you if you take action like if you take small action you can make a difference for this society i think mm -hmm. yeah you have to know this fact really well so yeah that's my thoughts mm -hmm. thank you i mean um you know the the um I think you mentioned that you have a plan um, to mm -hmm. um, start um, the closing, mm -hmm. the lentil business, right? Yes. And I think the background of this is because the, the, there's a people, the, the consumers, the awareness, they change from, the, they, they don't really interested in owning the product. Yeah. Now they, they are interested in sharing mm -hmm. or, or leasing the things. And I think this particularly happened in the younger generations. And I think this business model itself, it's, uh, it's kind of shifting uh, from, from, from the ownership to, to the, the you know, lender. And I think that's the extension of what you're doing is a, you know, th those a trend uh, you are following it. And I think it's good. And the one thing I wanna also ask that, what about Miki? Um, you have organized you know, events um, to raise awareness, um, you know, for data literacy, which is, I think it's very important and to advance the, um, you know, circular economy. And, and do you have any thoughts on, on the way to make, um, you know, the community you belong um, to actively um, participate in circular economy? Do you have any thoughts on that? Mm, thank you for your question. You have two events, right? Yes. One is online and one is face to face. Yes. And I think, uh, you know, that is, you know, is a great step to to change people's mind. Yes. So, for me, uh, yeah, in my case, I was in different to this event, but the very yeah one of the chance to become more interested in the issues or was, uh, was uh, e know, uh, knowing each other 
knowing each other, nothing. Knowing nothing. Sorry, just a moment. Uh, is, Take your time. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, first of all, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I joined the online community, closed community after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And yes, and the many of member wa was working on the environmental or social issues. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them was traveler, but mm -hmm. they are also they were also like to the arts or beautiful landscape around the world, and mm -hmm. and they and they did beach clean or uh, as Sophie, as Sophie presented ma. Uh, uh, I know the ma ma hold the march. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you're supporting the movement, the actions um, mm -hmm. for 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 you know the motivated the local people to 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 you know take action. Uh, so so I think it is most important thing is. Mm. Uh, to show the many options right, right. Mm. which make you happy or without, uh, no, uh, or ha have fun mm. taking care of yours is very mm -hmm. good importance. Mm. Important. I like the idea of that um, you, you're, um, uh, you know, raising the points where that, you, you know, we need to seek the accurate information and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, to be out of curiosity and also the get, um, you know, view, many viewpoints as much as possible to, to form your opinions and to take action, right action. And I think that's, that's very um, fundamentally uh, important, uh, you know, for, for, for to implement the circular economy. And, and um, that, that's very good. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, um, I think that um, um, one of the other things that uh, also I wanted to um, um, ask um, um, uh, or the panel is that, um, you know, just wondering well, what kind of a changes that do we need um, as a consumer uh, to implement uh, circular economy? I think we are referring back a little bit about, um, uh, you know, the transition to the business, different business model from existing business model where we have a linear, uh, you know, model, but today, we, we learned a little bit about um, uh, Lasse's uh, talk of the, you know, the ecosystem strategy uh, of the um, very interesting loop um, concept. And, um, but for, for um, as a consumer, what, what kind of, you know, behavioral change do we need to implement um, circular economy? Um, would that Tura perhaps, um, if you could um, add something that, you know, your uh, um, thoughts on this? Thank you. I'm happy to uh, figure out something. Uh, first of all, I think that circular economy, it really is a key for the sustainable future uh, mm. because we are running out of the resources. Um, mm. But in addition to that, that we, we create this kind of circularity, we need to also all consider our consumption because we are over consuming the resources. So I think this is a challenge for everybody, mm. especially mm. in the Western and mm. um, Eastern countries where we have a high level of, uh, um, um, we, are, we are using quite a lot of resources mm. because of our living standards. So I think that's something we, everybody could think how to reduce the consumption and how to turn towards consumption of um, products that are more sustainable. Mm. using mm. Uh, renewable resources. Sure, mm. right. Um, thanks for that. I mean, I, I do recognize the, um, the significance of the move, you know, the shifting to the circular economy model. And, and, but it looks like um, the, we, we still have the, um, the, the need to be creative, um, especially for 
existing linear mo business model. It's still existing. And, um, but for that linear model, they has to also achieve the same um, goal of this you know, circular economy. And because we still have the, those you know, consumers that they wanted to choose to own um, products rather than renting, as I just mentioned before. And um, so my question is, uh, you know, the, um, or does this movement, the shift uh, to the circular economy also need rethinking or, um, of the, or rethinking of the current economic model uh, for existing model? We need to be creative. Um, you know, we cannot just change the model to the next model, but um, uh, what, 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 what do you think about, um, you know, what kind of a um, rethinking we need? I will tell you a little bit um, um, example for this. Um, like, um, you know, the company offering the, well, you know, the company on the, based on the linear uh, business model, they, they offer the consumers, um, you know, the product care once they purchase it, but they, they care, you know, offer the repairing service. So they're not yet 100% the circular economy business model, but they they are offering the the so the lasting the lifetime of the product by offering the repairing service to the customers, and so um, what kind of a um, um, you know attitude for um, um, we need rethinking of the uh, how to be creative of the current economic model. Um, Lasse. Um, do you have any? Anything yeah, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think that in uh, in in businesses it's about continuous development, mm -hmm. and it has lots of similarities with, uh, with the quality development that that mm -hmm. you you um, you of course the um, uh, make cor corrective decisions and 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 improvements to the products and services step by step. And now that we are thinking that what kind of corrections and what kind of uh, revised versions of the products we need, we have to think that how we can uh, turn them towards these new new business models. And is there a possibility to maybe change some of the raw materials to less harmful? Is it the opportunity to change from fossil energy to renewable in production chain, or is there possibility to produce if more efficiently the product or organize the take back system for the product so that when when consumers don't anymore need that product it can be taken back and processed into a new one or is, is there a take back system for that specific product so that it is not just a mass of plastic that is produced but it is a still the raw material is a remains as, as high quality as possible and can be used for better better value so it's continuous continuous improvement thinking and also utilizing innovations what i see important is that of course to reduce the consumption as as mentioned and also substitute or replace replace the harmful ones with less harmful so that kind of improvements along the along the uh, development so continuous continuous improvement and and what is good is that it seems to be a more and more practice in in in, in large scale enterprises and also smaller ones that it's actually about their survival so if we mm -hmm. ask that would you invest in a company who causes lots of greenhouse gas emissions and contributes to, to the global warming really extensively? Or would you invest in company that would align with the climate agreements and does things in a, in a more sustainable manner? So maybe investors also think that, okay, that is more attractive one, that, that follows the new business model, not the old, old one that causes the challenges. So it's about continuous improvement. But of course, there's lots of, lots, of, lots of work to do. Sure. Sure, we have lots of work to do, <laughs> indeed. OK. Well, um, thank you very much, Lasse. Um, and it uh, looks like we had uh, all presenters um, um, addressed to each questions and a bit of a discussion. Um, so I want to thank 
um, our presenters for sharing your thoughts. And also I wanna thank all the uh, online participants for posting um, questions in this discussion segment. And thank you all. Um, so I, I hope that today's um, presentations and discussion segments um, give you the opportunity um, to rethink the way we um, um, you know, consume food and clothes and many other products. And I do also give you uh, inspiration uh, to, to give, you know, get up and play active part uh, in your community, wherever you are in the world to achieve the advanced you know, uh, circular economy. Um, finally, um, I wanna thank everyone for attending this segment and it was pleasure and privilege and to be your moderator today. Um, thank you very much. Uh, that's all from me, Tomoko-san, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, your moderation and um, thank you for your uh, wrap up. Yeah, we could learn their various ways to approach circular economy today. And yeah, thanks for, thank you for all presenters and Professor Shimura and also all participants today. So as I mentioned, uh, you can still post comments and questions on Padlet and presenters are, are also invited to Padlet and reply to some of questions after the conference. And we have also Slack, which is an application to keep our connection. So this is for all guest speakers and students presenters and students who participate to this conference. Oh, welcome to join Slack. And I guess you can see the link on the Zoom chat box. And if you want to continue the discussion and communication, you can do that in Slack even after the conference. So we finished this session today. And if you are in Zoom, as Professor Shimura mentioned, you can stay and we can talk, we talk uh, and stay, uh, yeah, and half an, half an hour to discuss further if you would like to stay. So don't close the webinar if you want to continue. And so thank you so much for today. And we'll have uh, day three from the same time, um, from, uh, from the same time. And it's about microplastics. And if you haven't watched the documentary film, which is called Microplastic Madness, uh, we highly recommend to watch the documentary before, before the talk. Uh, so you can ask questions to the director of this film, Atsuko. So see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>